Hey, this is the second part of the Eileen Cook um, webinar for BCTLA. Take it away, Eileen. All right, so I just finished doing our reading and what I wanted to uh, talk about what actually came up during the break was another one of my books, which is called The Hanging Girl, which when it came out in paperback was re-released as One Lie Too Many. Um, so I wanna tell the story of just how that happened because I think people find it somewhat interesting. So the first thing a lot of people don't know is that authors don't necessarily get to choose the title of their book. So you have a title that you turn in with the book, um, but the publisher will then make a decision, are there too many titles that are similar? Do they think it's the best title? What do they think will sell the book? This is where I have to admit that generally speaking, I'm pretty horrible at titles. It's not necessarily my skill set at all. And I think I had just called this book the psychic book because it's about a girl who's a fake psychic. So I knew it wasn't the title that we would be keeping. Um, but in it, of course, she uses tarot cards. And one of the tarot cards, I learned to read tarot cards for the book, uh, one of the tarot cards that is out there is called The Hanging Man. And The Hanging Man card deals with uncertainty. That's what it means if you are to pull that card. So the main character talks about, she feels like she's the hanging girl because she feels like her whole life is uncertain. So they decided that would be the title of the book, it would be The Hanging Girl. And then they also, things a lot of people don't know, you don't have necessarily control of the cover. So this was the cover that they designed and they sent to me. And I wasn't sure if I liked it. Um, and so we have some debate because some people on the table were like, oh, I love that cover. Um, what worried me about this cover was I thought it looked too much like a horror novel. Um, and it's not a horror novel. So is it contemporary? It is contemporary. Um, it doesn't look contemporary to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I worried that it wasn't, and on the back they have playing cards, which she doesn't do anything with playing cards. She uses tarot cards. Um, so I just wasn't sure if that was the best. So they did add to the top of it. I said, I feel like it needs something. So it says, trust no one, deceive everyone was the tagline that they went with. But so I liked that. I thought that worked kind of for the book. But otherwise, I wasn't completely sold on it. When the book came out, it did really well in terms of critical feedback. I got, uh, it actually won the John Spray Awards. So it won for Best Mystery in Canada that year. Um, we got good reviews, all that kind of stuff. But sales weren't that particularly high. And so when they went back to retailers and said, with, uh, with Malice, which was the book before, it had sold quite, quite well, why did they think people weren't buying it? And several booksellers said, I don't think the cover is popping. So they decided to have a new cover. <laughs> uh, and as part of that, they, the other feedback people got is people thought it was about suicide, teen suicide, um, which is not you know, a topic that a lot of people think like, hey, I wanna get a book on that. Um, so they decided to rename it and they came up with one lie too many and did that. So the only problem is, which I hate, I required them, you'll find this interesting, because there's nothing I hate more than when you buy a book and you start reading it and you're like, hey, I've read this book before. So I didn't want that to happen. So I said, it has to say somewhere, it was originally The Hanging Girl. And I want people to notice in size what might be <laughs> negative one font at the very bottom. It says formally titled The Hanging Girl. So they did put it on there for me, but I still expect to hear from people who didn't find that out. <laughs> so people always ask of writers, where do you get ideas? And I think that's kind of often the biggest question that we get here from people. And to be honest, for me, ideas have never been a difficult thing. I, if, if anything, I wonder how people don't come up with ideas. Like to me, they're absolutely everywhere. So I love overheard conversations. Um, I'm a huge spy in coffee shops. I love to sit and listen. Uh, I have a line of dialogue that I haven't used yet, that I'm saving, but I share it because I love it so much. It was around Christmas time. And there was a couple that was clearly fighting about the holidays and how they were spending holidays with family. And it was clear that the male was not very religious and his partner, she was religious. And so this was part of the friction. And she said, all of a sudden, she just slammed something down. She said, just so you know, Santa is nothing more than the clown at Jesus's birthday party. <laughs> and I was like, I got up. 
I asked the barista for a pen. Like I'm like, I am writing this down right now. Um, but I have used a lot of overheard conversations and kind of played them out to the next level. I'm constantly that person as I'm walking around neighborhoods. I love to walk my dogs in the evening when people have their lights on because I like to imagine what's going on in those situations. You can spin stories from other stories. You Owe Me a Murder is obviously directly spun from re-watching an episode of Alfred Hitchcock, which got me on a binge. So I was watching a bunch of Hitchcock movies and then it got me back to reading the original Highsmith books, which I really loved. And I started thinking like, it would be really interesting to do an updated version of that and how it would play out. So oftentimes there are things like that. There are people who are inspired by paintings and have done entire stories from paintings any of those things will happen. Um, probably the biggest is life experiences. So there's something that happens to you in some way, shape or form, and you end up wanting to explore it. Because what all of these things have in common is what writers always think of is the what if question. Um, so with Malice, uh, tells the story of two friends who are at a point in their friendship where things are changing. Um, so the main character has always kind of been the second in command. Um, as she always says, the donkey to Shrek, you know, all those kinds of things, the Watson to Sherlock. And she's the one who's going off to university and it's quite, enough, quite clear that her life is about to take off. And her best friend, who's always been the kind of star of the show, is not. She's not headed to university. She's going to stay in her small town. And it's causing friction between the two of them. And that is exactly what happened to me and my best friend. Um, so my best friend in high school, Laura, for clarity, I never wanted to murder her. <laughs> I feel like I need to put that out there. Um, but yes, yeah, spoiler alert. I never wanted to murder my best friend. Um, but we had this huge problem because she was super outgoing. She was the one who got invited to parties and I kind of trailed along, but we were at this point where I was headed off to university and I really felt like my world was opening up. And for her, she had gotten a job in the mall and it was quite clear she was gonna still be working in the mall when I graduated. And we were having problems with that and we didn't know how to deal with that. Spoiler alert on my friendship. She would later ditch the loser boyfriend that she was with, go back to university. Now we're great friends again, we've all caught up. There's all that, but we still talk about that inability. And I do find it interesting in terms of YA where there's what your life has always been. And when you are coming up to your senior year, there's suddenly the awareness, like, I don't actually have to live in this town. I don't have to be friends with these people. I don't have to do any of those things. And that's both terrifying and really exciting. And depending on how much privilege you have to do certain things, I had the great privilege. I knew I was going to university. I knew my parents would support me with that. All of that was opening up. And for her, she definitely was not feeling so I think kind of that what if often starts things for people. Um, I was on a ferry and I saw one of those age enhanced photos that they have of missing kids in the white spot lineup. And I turned to a friend of mine, and I was like, wouldn't it be weird if you look like the age enhanced photo? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and I, I wrote that down and that became a book called The Almost Truth, which is about a teen con artist who decides to pull this con trying to pose as this missing child to get some money and then begins to believe she actually is the missing girl so for me that was just a one snapshot moment uh, i'm currently writing an adult book about a woman who goes through a divorce and kills her ex-husband in france i don't know where it's coming from except i recently got divorced and went to france he's still alive i would say i just want to put that out there as well um, but it becomes those things of playing things out. So sort of often taking something that you're dealing with and being like, what if you really couldn't cope with that? What if you went off the deep end and took something to the extreme? Those are the fun things that are to play with, with ideas. Uh, there tend to be two kinds of writers. So the first type of writer is what they call a plotter. So those are people who kind of plot out exactly what's gonna happen in their book. Um, the other book writers are called pansters which is writing by the seat of your pants. Um, so much like gender where we used to say, you're, you know, you're male or you're female or you're a plotter or you're a pamster, it's a spectrum. <laughs> People are, are kind of all the way on that. Um, I definitely, my first three books were pantsed. 
um, primarily. I usually had some idea of where the book was going and what I wanted to have happen, but I didn't have anything plotted out. Um, the more I started to write, what happened for me is I was able to sell what's called proposal. So that's where if I went to my editor and I said, I have this great idea for a new YA, this is what it's about, they would say, oh, well, give me an outline uh, in the first 10 pages, and then they would write me a check, which is awesome, because then I could use that money to live on while I was writing the book. But of course, what that meant is they actually wanted an outline. They didn't want something like, well, I think that it's going to be something. Yeah, they Someone wanted dies. Somebody's going to die. And I don't, it's hard to say. So they wanted an actual outline. So I began to do more outlining. I still find I'm somewhere in the middle. Like I'm definitely more of an outliner now than I used to be because I've gotten into the habit of it. Having said that, I'm still very comfortable with getting so far into the book and then being like, no, that outline isn't right anymore. It needs to change. This shouldn't be her dad, it should be her brother. This should be this, this shouldn't be that. Uh, all of those things will change. Um, the love interest in You Owe Me a Murder, um, he was gay in the first draft of the book. And then I was like, he's not gay, he's in love with her. Like, I have to change that around. Like, that's not working anymore. Like, it'll be more tension if they have a romantic relationship, not just a friendship. So I ended up changing that situation. So you have to sometimes be willing, I think, to kind of go where the story is going to lead you. Um, there is no right way to write. Um, I think oftentimes when I give talks, either to kids or to adults, they're like, well, how do I, like, how can I do this? And I can't tell you how you can do it. I can only tell you how I do it. Uh, I know some writers who do vision boards. So they're cutting pictures out and they're doing something and they talk about when they get stuck, they look up at it and they're like, often the answer's in the board. Like it's some subconscious level, I knew that. So I thought that sounded awesome. And I like bought all these used magazines through a bookstore and like $200 of craft supplies from Michael's. And I like made this huge board. And I never looked at it once the entire time I wrote the book. Like it just, that's not part of my process. Again, some people outline, some people hate to outline. Um, some people write great in the morning. Some people can't write until evening. Um, if you read a book like Stephen King's on writing, he says, you know, you need to write every day. I don't think that you do. I think you need to write on a regular basis if you're gonna finish a book on time. Um, I used to be a counselor, that was my day job. Um, and I was a manager by the time that I left my job. So I was used to project planning. And so to a large degree, that's what I do now. If I have a due date of um, December 25th for a book, I know like, okay, I know I'm gonna need to spend this amount of time to revise it, this amount of time to do it. I know I can write so many words per week and I can back out where I need to be at each stage in order to be on time. Um, and I'm fairly self-disciplined, which is the other thing that is required. This idea that there's going to always be a muse and you're going to sit down and it's going to flow from your fingertips isn't the truth. Like you just sometimes have to sit down and just get it out. Um, as I said very earlier on, you can't fix a blank page. So I'm always a fan of just getting going. If it's really a bad time for me, what I'll do is I'll trick myself. So I'll say, if I write for 30 minutes, I can quit for the rest of the day and I won't feel guilty about it. And sometimes I do, I write for the 30 minutes and it's painful and it's whatever and then I quit. Um, but often if I start, I'll keep going. I did think when I quit my day job, I'm gonna write so many books now because I can write all day. Um, but the truth of the matter is I can't. I don't have that much creative energy. Um, so for me, I can really like create new material for about two to four hours a day. That's a little different. Sometimes when I'm very close to the end, I turn into one of those people. Um, I've been known, um, when I was married, I would actually sometimes get a hotel room for a weekend and because I would have absolutely no distractions and I would write for just those days because I was close to the end, I could feel it almost speeding up and I wanted to be there. But otherwise, I really have about three or four hours that I can actually write in a day. So however you get the book out, that's how you have to do it. Um, other things that I kind of tell people about is you need to know why you want to write. You need to remember that and kind of keep that in mind for yourself for the days that it doesn't go well. Um, for myself, this is what I always wanted to do. I wanted to do this since I was a little girl and I love it. And 
while I would love if my books get you know taught in schools a hundred years from now and all those kinds of things I don't write for that reason I write for who I was as a kid I write for that kid who wants to be distracted who's maybe not having a great time in high school um, and is finding an escape through books um, and for whatever reason they're escaping that's what I want to do I want to create a story that that pulls them in um, the best compliment I've ever gotten, better than the John Spray Award, better than you know movie offers or anything else, is I have an email, and I, I still keep up with her, but she's a young reader who sent me a letter talking about, um, she had read my book called The Education of Haley Kendrick, which is a comedy. And she said, I wanna tell you how much I'm liking the book. I've been laughing out loud, and it's the first time I've laughed in a long time. My mom's in hospice care and she's dying. Uh, and you, when I read your book, it's the only time I don't think about it. Um, and that just broke my heart a thousand different ways. But it also just, like, that's why I do it. I do it so that somebody has that moment and that feeling. And um, I've kept in touch with her for it's been years now. But, um, you know, we still kind of write back and forth every so often. And for me, it, it's that reminder about why I do it. And that keeps me going on the times uh, when it's not so great. <laughs> so that is, in essence, how to be a writer <laughs> 101. Mm -hmm. um, there's no real secret to it that I can sort of tell anyone other than you have to figure out your own particular way. Um, for me, I have two dogs. I get up, I walk my dogs every morning, <laughs> I sit down. Uh, and I tend to do my writing kind of that early to mid morning is when I get the bulk of my creative time done. Um, after that, I'm doing things like edits or I'm going through, there's a lot of social media and various things. Um, and that's another thing that authors now have to think about is how present do they want to be on social media? How honest do you want to be on social media? Um, because of course, her just like teens are learning to navigate that thing um you've got to decide how much you want to be on there but i am on the social media platforms i post a lot about my dogs mm -hmm. a lot about my dogs on there so that's what keeps me busy i'm going to take some pictures while we were in my room all right you're going to take some pictures um but i'm curious if anyone has any questions who's your book for you? <laughs> well, i don't know if i have to think about it now I mean, you can never go wrong with Lord Darcy, right? <laughs> so that would be an ongoing one. <laughs> like all the different versions. Yeah, all the, like, well, Colin Firth version is my particular favorite version. Um, but I'm open. Um, I don't know if I have a current one. I've been reading a lot of thrillers, so they're not really boyfriends. They're people who are often murdering their wives. <laughs> so less God dating. Goodness. Yeah, less dating of them. So that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, just because I know people will ask, um, you've written YA and adult fiction. So the question is, what have what have I written? So uh, my very first book um, was adult romantic comedy. After that, I wrote primarily YA, although I did do a middle grade series called The Fourth Grade Fairy, um, which is kind of designed for that early readers crowd. Um, uh, they've done some graphic novel stuff of it. Yeah. And it was not originally a graphic novel, it's a chapter book. Um, so I've done that, and now I, the book I'm currently writing isn't another, it's a dark adult romantic, well, not really romantic comedy, but it's comedy, hopefully. And is the uh, writing process a little bit different for middle school because you had to do that? That was your audience. Well, it was interesting because the idea for my middle grade novel just came to me. So I was uh, sitting and talking and I used to talk quite often with my editor and we were talking about various things and I was saying how, you know, all the books are always about kids who are ordinary and discover that they have some magical capacity and oh, they're actually a wizard or all those things. And so wouldn't it be interesting to do a book about someone who's like part of a fairy godmother family, but desperately wishes that she was normal and not just a, like just human. That's all she wants to be. And my editor is like, that's really interesting. And then she emailed me the next day and she said, I can come up with a cash offer if you want to write that book. So I was, <laughs> I'm a working writer. So I said, yes, I would love to. Um, but it was interesting because I haven't read middle grade since probably I was in middle grade. 
Um, so for me, the very first draft of that book was really hard for me to write. And it was actually having to go back and even simple things like my editor was great because she was coming back and she's like, you need more dialogue tags. Mm -hmm. So as we read, we sort of instinctively now know that, oh, when a new paragraph starts, a new person is talking. But the kids that you're writing for are just learning to read. Like they don't necessarily know that. So in kind of YA or adult fiction, we're often on people like, you have too many dialogue tags, take out the Tosh said, Eileen said, Amanda said, and just, you know, have it clear. Um, but in middle grade, you were putting them back in, making sure that the sentences were a little bit shorter, um, thinking about word choice. Um, I often get asked about writing for young adults is I don't actually think writing for young adults is really any different than writing for adults. Um, as we talked about kind of on the right, everything comes up and is discussed in a YA book. You will find YA books <coughs> covering absolutely any and all topics. Um, what is different is you need to make sure that first of all, that you have a teen protagonist and that you're staying firmly within that teen's point of view mm -hmm. because that's where the story is being communicated from. Um, I myself personally have some things that I just wouldn't necessarily choose to write about because just for me, it feels like that doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, in fairness, I probably wouldn't write it in an adult book either. So I'm not sure that it's actually different. I do find it interesting when I've gotten pushback, it's never been on violence in the book, it's been more on sex. Um, so one of my books, actually it takes place after a divorce and the two teens have now been moved in, their parents have gotten married. So it's two 17 year olds who now find themselves stepbrother and stepsister. Um, and they, they fall in love because they weren't raised as siblings. Like their parents just got married and they've just, and I had a school district in Texas that banned it, calling it incest. I had a whole- Isn't that great when they banned your book? It, it, I didn't, like I got more promotion because they banned it than because of anything else. And no doubt, just like the library who said, that's a nasty book, kids were suddenly like, wait a minute, yeah. like, there's something in there I'm not supposed to read. Um, so they were possibly more interested in it. Um, but no one has said anything about murdering kids. Like I haven't gotten any pushback about <laughs> the violence. It's been about those, and I certainly don't write graphic scenes, you know, sex scenes or anything like that that was happening. So sometimes what upsets people, I find bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, so word, you're going to give them ideas. Yeah. Like, like, and I don't, and again, that. I read Stephen King as a kid. Like I don't, and then when I was, I'm dating myself. When I was growing up, there really wasn't a YA section. You went pretty much from Judy Bloom to adult. Like wow. YA really started in the late 1970s, Potter, right? early 80s. Uh, it was a little bit before that, like the Outsiders was one of the first kind of things. Flowers in the Attic. Flowers in the Attic. Um, some of those were kind of the initial kind of wave that was starting, but it really didn't take off until Harry Potter. That was the real explosion in YA. Um, but you know, what I find interesting is I remember in high school, we would all read a lot of Harlequin romances that would all fall open to the dirty bits. Do you know what I mean? Like we all, Judas the, yeah, we would all be like, oh, that's the part you want to read. And nobody was seeming to police what we were doing. Um, so I always find it interesting. Like I'm much more interested. I've had a couple of my books, strangely enough, the incest book um, was chosen by a mother daughter book club. And I can't remember one of the States and they actually really liked it because it, they had a lot of discussions about how did you feel about the divorce? And I married this person and I kind of assumed that now we're a family, but that doesn't feel like you're a family. So they had a great discussion about it and certainly no one was upset, but other people, clearly were. Um, so the big advice I would say if you want to write for kids is do not write down to them. They are smart and savvy and probably know more than you do. So I think whenever it feels like you're writing an after school special, like, and that Lisa is why drugs are bad. Like they can read that and they're not, they have other people who will tell them a moral lesson. They just want a good story, which doesn't mean your story can't have a good moral lesson. It's just that's not the reason it should be there. Yes. I have a craft question specifically yes. about with Malice. Um, did you write it like chapter one to the end or did you write it in two separate like the trip story and the post accident story? I wrote it beginning to end um, but I did outline it before I started. Okay. 
So I knew where each of the things were going. And there were some things that got moved around as the story went along. So I did keep it. It seemed like it would be hard to keep track of because she doesn't remember. So (laughs) it's not just two timelines. It's one timeline where it's like almost like two different protagonists because she doesn't have the memory of the... I actually had to keep... I have a notebook where it's like what she knew and what she doesn't know. Nice. Um, One of my favorite school visits of all time was in Montreal. And they read with malice. And the school did a trial of the main character (laughs) and they did a trial to decide whether or not she was guilty of the crime or not because it doesn't actually go to trial in the book she gets i don't know she She wakes up at the beginning in the hospital and she can't remember if she did the crime or not so she has to decide and so the high school actually did they called witnesses who were various characters in the book and I That's like, fun. honestly, like I was like the whole thing like That would be really fun. And then what happened, right? So I was really interested because <laughs> he totally steals Did you get a court idea. transcript? <laughs> you I didn't get been, a like, court transcript. Was the transcriptionist in this courtroom? But what was interesting is I often get asked by kids because the end of the book, I made a very deliberate choice. The main character doesn't know. So the basic premise of With Malice is she wakes up in the hospital. She's been in a car accident, so she has no idea what's happened. She's lost memory of not only the accident, but the six weeks prior to the accident, which is quite common. I actually worked in the head injury unit at GF Strong. That was my day job. So I'm very familiar with head injury and and all those kinds of things. So she wakes up, she has no idea what's happened. um, And the police inform her, we don't believe it was an accident. Uh, Your best friend was killed in the accident. And we believe that you murdered her and then we're attempting to kill yourself. And she's horrified. And so the book is her trying to figure out what happened in that time period that she cannot remember. Mm -hmm. And so various people are chiming in, but of course, if you've ever done anything, eyewitness testimony (laughs) is very dangerous because how people interpret things and it's not clear what their intentions are. Uh, I played a lot with the Amanda Knox trial in this book because I was fascinated by that. So things Mm -hmm. like, Amanda Knox was called Foxy Noxy, mm-hmm. um, which everyone said, oh, it's because she was kind of, you know, sexually adventurous and all these things. And she was actually called Foxy Noxy because she was really fast on the soccer field. Mm-hmm. Her teammates had given her that name. So it had no sexual connotations at all, um, but it was taken that way. So I just found it interesting. There's a lot of social media things that happen in this book where people are becoming very consumed with this case and did she do it or not do it? And she doesn't know. At the end of the book, she has an idea, but it's been very well clarified that she will never know if she's actually remembering it correctly or if it's a made-up memory. Because one of the things with head injury, when you've had amnesia, and you probably have had the same experience if you've ever had something that's happened to you as a kid, and you don't know if you actually remember that story, if it's because it was told to you. <laughs> so she doesn't actually know if what she's remembering is a real memory or not a real memory. And it's left ambiguous. And my number one questions from kids is always like, yeah, okay, I know that you left it, you know, ambiguous on purpose. Like, but did she do it? <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you think? And they're like, well, yes or no. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, yeah, but okay, but did she do it? And I'm like, and I, I have my own feeling about it, but I, I don't say publicly. I, I say it's very deliberately. She has to make a choice because that's the condition that she has. She will never know for sure. She has to make a choice, so you have to make a choice. Um, but it drives them crazy. So they had a they had a trial, and they decided whether she was guilty or innocent. So what did they fun. decide? They decided guilty. But there was one person who was like very angry. I was like, "That's not fair! Like, we want to appeal. We want to appeal." And I was like, "Wow, it's going on for days." Um, but it was interesting because they had all read the book, so people took different characters, and some people were lawyers, and one person was her. And it was very I enjoyed it. Have you ever thought about doing, uh, I don't know what this would be like for a read aloud. Uh, did the school do it? Was it a read aloud or did no. the students read it themselves? They read it themselves. Because okay. I and was then, wondering how you would feel about doing an audio book. Uh, there is an audio book of With Malice. Thank you. I'm not you do that. Yeah, there is okay. one. Um, there is one actually of One Lie Too Many, but it's not out yet. It should be coming out in the next month or so. It's supposed to be out, so there will be one of those. Um, and it'll be interesting because in a lot of cases I retained audio rights, which means you can actually now go back and get audiobooks made. So I may be doing that because now you can actually do it in a way that you couldn't do it a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's nice. It's fun. It's good. All right. With Malice. 
know. All I, right. have, I have about 50. I don't know. <laughs> well, I will thank everyone. I will thank people that are on that I can't actually see, uh, but I know that you're there. And thanks to uh, Sarah for having me. So, thank you, honey. Like, Christy and I were sitting in the, I think in our union office, going, we have this idea. Who would be crazy enough to do this with us? And you were the first person that came to mind. I'm touched. <laughs> Someone has to do that person. So thank you so You're much. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm going to leave you with one extra copy to give away to students or whatever. I'm ready to students. Um, please help yourself to copy. <laughs> She's like, please.